Well, the, we have a, a sort of history of thinking about trying to contain epidemics um, in the first instance to keep them local, avoid them spreading internationally. Um, if we fail to do that, we then turn to mitigation, which is then trying to alleviate the magnitude of the epidemic, perhaps lengthening its duration at a lower level so that the serious cases don't saturate the capability of the healthcare system. I think for influenza, the concept of having two stages is a little bit false. That influenza is the most highly transmissible of the known common infectious diseases and containment in today's globally mixing world is extremely difficult. By the time you've detected an, a novel outbreak, via our connectance through major cities and the international airline network, the virus is essentially seeded in so many different cities, it's very difficult to contain. What one can do is mitigate, and uh, mitigation can be slightly lengthening the early phase of the epidemic where it's stuttering around, it's not taking off steeply and exponentially. And I think during the first six weeks of a, an influenza epidemic, then it is desirable to spend money on trying to mitigate impact heavily at that stage. And that may involve, depending on culture, depending on particular society, closure of schools, certainly, and then delivering strong public health messages about um, trying to avoid large mixing communities. Now, this recent epidemic of H1N1 was thankfully very mild. And so, in a sense, there was internationally and government by government a slight overreaction. The reasons for that are complex, uh, and I won't go into them now, but in essence, if the disease was much more severe than the one we've just experienced, where the case fatality rate was higher, then I think the public themselves would respond too. They'd be slightly frightened, and they would have a mitigation response, which would be avoiding mixing, and they'd be asking government about hand washing and masks and face masks and so on. We're talking about your own government's response, you always have to be a little bit careful, um, <laughs> having worked both in the civil service and as advisor to government. But I think we've, we've come to a, a consensus about a, a series of issues. The first is, and this is broader than the UK government, it relates to the World Health Organization um, and its definition of what is a pandemic. And it has these staged levels of four, five, and six, and six is a truly global pandemic. A lot more careful thought needs to be put into defining this. Um, and in particular, it's not so much the international spread, because with our global network of air travel now, there's always going to be a degree of international spread. It's much more to do with the case fatality and case morbidity rates. Now, for those who are not um, physicians or scientists or epidemiologists in this area, what they're probably not aware is that when you've had an infection, your blood and your saliva has an imprint of that infection. And if you take blood or saliva in a, a, a sample of the population, you can work out the numbers who truly have been exposed. And then you take the numbers of serious cases reported and you look at the, what fraction are they of the total numbers. And that gives you the case morbidity rate. And then you take the number of deaths versus the total number exposed and that gives you the case fatality rate. Now what happened with H1N1 is the early reports coming out of Mexico suggested a case fatality rate of about 0.1%, um, 1 in a 1,000. And that set alarm bells ringing because that's quite a pathogenic influenza. It's not as bad as the 1918 epidemic, but it's pretty serious. What was not recognized and done in Mexico was taking samples of blood and saliva in the rural communities and in Mexico City to work out the total numbers that who'd been infected, not those who'd presented as serious cases. And when that total number calculations have been done, both in uh, Hong Kong very recently, but 
um, in the summer of 2009 in the United Kingdom and then in the autumn of 2009 in the United States in Philadelphia, for example. What transpired is a lot more people have been infected than we'd seen cases. And so there was a lot of mild asymptomatic infection, particularly in children. And the true case fatality rate is somewhere of the order of one in a hundred thousand, which puts it as a, a rather mild seasonal influenza. So the major lesson is do serology, this blood and saliva, so that in the early stages of the epidemic, you truly calculate its severity. You don't rely just on the reporting of serious disease. First message. Second message, um, logistics of delivery of vaccine and drug. Drug first, um, where there were stockpiles held in the United Kingdom, and we were slow and pretty amateur in the way we delivered that to the primary health care system. And indeed, at one stage, there was a sort of helpline with anybody who rang up the helpline and said, can I have a, an anti-flu drug, please? It was given to them. That's not an effective way of doing it. It's very expensive and wasteful. And so a lot of the detail of logistics of how to deliver health care, both in the primary and the secondary care settings, were not worked through. All governments had their pandemic plans at a high level. And I think history tells us always it's, it's easy to set the high level objectives. The operational detail and the logistics of delivery are much more complicated. And I don't think any government practiced those enough. Probably Hong Kong and Singapore better than most. For a historical reason, you experience SARS. Right. Um, so those are the first two. There are many others um, which are more related to the detail of a particular country, like the information capture systems were very poor in the beginning. And in today's world of the internet and web-based, we really should have electronic data capture real-time display of the information so the public can understand how the epidemic is spreading. And in the early stages, both in the United States and the United Kingdom, and I suspect the same was true here in Singapore, the BBC and CNN websites had better data than the Departments of Health. In other words, real-time capture and maps of what was going on. Well, it, nowadays medicine is becoming more and more scientific and uh, the delivery of care is becoming more interdisciplinary. Um, so if you take surgery as an example, increasingly it's robotic micro incisions. Um, increasingly checking health is to do with imaging of the whole body and these are applications for engineering. Mathematics is the, is the base core of all science. It's the way of describing processes precisely so that independent of language or culture, if it's mathematically described, you can assess precisely what assumptions are being made. Now, it may seem surprising to the general public, or indeed scientists outside of this field, that something as complicated as an epidemic and all the human culture and nature can be described mathematically. But the last two decades have shown that it can indeed be described mathematically, and one has world simulators now which treat every individual in the person in the world within the simulation and these are supercomputing problems they're not things you can do on your laptop but it, they're doable now there are many assumptions in there and there are many things to do with estimating data about movement and mixing of people both in the family in your workplace in your friendship networks your national travel and then your international travel Increasingly, the mobile phone is providing a way for us to measure these um, because the mobile phone has a, a GPS chip which gives you a location. And so the models are becoming more and more sophisticated. Now, clearly, there's always development. But I can see the stage that you or I would not get into an aeroplane unless somebody had done some detailed complicate calculations about whether it would take off with that load and so on. We wouldn't live in a building which hadn't been checked for its structural integrity by mathematical analysis. Why should we implement health policy issues of huge expense and importance without doing calculations to work out if they're going to work and what is the optimum way of using them 
and what is the most cost-beneficial way of using them. And so mathematics increasingly will play a, a very big role in medicine. I made the point um, in the first day of the conference that I thought for influenza that the terms containment and mitigation were incorrect for that particular infectious agent. And it's largely because it has a very short generation time. The generation time is defined by epidemiologists at the point that you get infected and the average time when you transmit it on to somebody else. And for influenza, that's about two to two and a half days. So it's very quick. So their containment is almost impossible. Now, if the disease was different, such as SARS, um, where the incubation and generation time was much, much longer, perhaps by a factor four to five, then it may be possible, um, through very simple public health measures, as was proved in the case of SARS, which is quarantine and isolation, which don't involve drugs or vaccines, to actually not only contain, but to, to snuff out, to dampen out the epidemic very quickly. Thank you.